Hello, I'm Chester Tennyson. I'm a trans male visual artist based in Manchester, England. My art practice consists of me playing with everyday objects and language, looking at the surreal and absurd elements within institutional design and instruction. Even though I only came out as trans a year and a half ago, my artwork throughout my career has always spoken about my transness, particularly in response to how I have felt constricted by the language and rules of a cisgender world throughout my life. This is a world that has always felt alien and absurd to me, where people use words that don't relate to me, and every social interaction carries the worry of me being misgendered or deadnamed. That changes the way I use spaces and how I navigate the world every day. It's my aim in my work to turn this alienation around though, and a lot of my work deals with reclaiming authority and language, or exposing the absurdity of institutional language. For this talk, I'm going to look back at my childhood and teenage years, as this best explains the roots of my practice. Many memories of my trans childhood and teenage years are embedded in my work. I grew up in Southport, and growing up there has had a significant influence on my work. If you've never been there, Southport is a seaside resort with a lot of golf courses. It also has a fairground and a smallest pub in Britain that is bigger than the smallest pub in Manchester, but the pub does have mirrors and good value beer, so maybe that's what makes it look bigger. Ironically, one of my first memories in Southport in the 80s was being in a ladies' Victorian public toilet with my mum. I remember looking up at the enormous wooden doors, tiles and signs, and I was scared. The authority within this design was terrifying. After that, I remember being weirdly obsessed with toilet designs throughout my childhood. It became a family joke that I needed to see the toilets of every public building I visited. I think I knew innately that toilets were going to be an issue for me. Other early memories of Southport also revolved around signage in the town centre, which was mostly Victorian and Edwardian, and mostly advertising the library, shoes or chips. Although what they advertised didn't always appeal to me, the craft of the sign making did. All of these municipal and arcade signs showed a power and a mastery to them in their own ways. They were made by skilled sign writers. This had a huge influence on me wanting to work with text and signage when I was at art college in the 90s. My home life was good in the 80s. I have fantastic parents who have always celebrated me being who I am. I'd always wear bow ties around the house, calling myself Murdoch from the A-team and probably also Indiana Jones on most days. I often feel like I'm channeling my younger self when I make my artwork, and I use direct objects from my childhood and my recent sculptures, which I retrieve from my parents' house when I go to visit them. When I'm working in my studio, I seem to regress to a childlike place with less boundaries and freedom to play. This act of free play is an important creative act, and I still see it as a small act of resistance in itself. Plus, I still eat secret sweets and chocolate in there, and I even have a paddling pool. But I don't dress up as Murdoch from the A-Team anymore. Before I came out as trans openly, I approached my artwork as a different form of play, certainly as a performance. I saw the work I made under my birth name as an alter ego's work. This alter ego was a character I played, and it functioned as an armour and a distraction from the real me. As a result, I didn't really make work which had my own voice in it, but a voice that was a distraction from who I actually am. The work often had negated contents because I didn't want to talk about anything to do with my actual self. There's a lot I regret about my work during this period, even though people enjoyed the work due to the humour. I think that I was always seeking out a positive response from an audience to mask what was actually happening in my life. But the work in this period did set out a form of resistance which I'm proud of. There's still humour in my recent work, and I think that's important, but I now allow myself to be more within the work, and I've said goodbye to my alter ego. Music was a big part of my childhood and teenage life. I'd often be seen dressing up as Freddie Mercury, playing Bohemian Rhapsody and pretending I was on top of the pops. I learnt to play the piano when I was six, and then I also learnt the guitar and drums when I was a teenager. As for many teenagers, cheesy lyrics to pop songs were really important to me, but mostly as they were a means of escape and a distraction from relationships I couldn't form due to my dysphoria. The titles of my recent work include lyrics from pop songs from the 80s and 90s. Using these lyrics in my work is a slight private joke to myself and my naivety of relationships. I like to think that most people can resonate with this though, and I like the thought of the audience walking around a gallery with my work in it, singing Madonna or Phil Oakey lyrics in their minds. My teenage years and my twenties were tricky times. I was starting to become more aware of the absurd and contradictory rules around me that govern my life, 
which didn't fit with who I was. As a teenager, I'd get stopped for going to either a male or female toilet for apparently going into the wrong room. I went to an all-girls school where other pupils asked why I was there because I was a boy, but at the same time the teachers called me a lady every five minutes. I didn't recognise my body. I wore a skirt and a blouse, but I was packing and binding underneath and doing voice exercises to make my voice deeper each morning. Lessons at school were difficult. Most school lessons revolved around stereotypical gender representations, even questions in maths textbooks. Science and biology lessons didn't make any sense. Transgender people were never discussed, and if anything queer was mentioned in a lesson, the comment would be ignored, as it was considered taboo. This was the era controlled by the Government Act, Section 28, where teachers were instructed to not talk about queer issues in the classroom. I, like many other students, were negated by the language and instruction used by authority. I lost interest in a lot of school subjects apart from art, history, theatre and film. These subjects started to help me gain a voice and form the basis of my practice now. I began to learn about the theatre of the absurd and loved Ionesco and Beckett. I also learnt about Dada in art and history. I'd go to take Liverpool all the time, and I became fixated on Gilbert and George's video, Gordon's Makes Us Drunk, in the Tate Permanent Collection. I was fixated because I was listening to queer voices, which I hadn't before, and these voices were being powerful through their absurdity. I also love Simon Patterson's work, The Great Bear at Tate, which appropriates the London Underground map and replaces the station names with the names of philosophers, film actors and footballers. This piece was a real turning point for me at art school. I realised that as an artist I could subvert the materials of order. After I finished my first degree at Manchester School of Art, I trained as a sign writer and worked for a sign company in Stockport. Socially, this was a difficult time for me, but I gained a lot of experience working in plastics, lamination and typography. The signs I made during work time were laborious, but once I got my own materials and brought these into the studio, I started to have more fun. In 2017, I started working in education myself, teaching undergraduate students fine art. As an educator, I feel like my life has gone full circle from my own student days. I'm in a position where I can make a difference, and equality and inclusivity are very important to me. It's fantastic to see the greater freedoms that the trans community has within the world now, in comparison to my childhood. But there's still plenty to do to educate people and move things on much further. I'm lucky that I have my artwork in my life every day so that I can use my voice as a source of pride and resilience. I'm also incredibly proud to say that I'm trans and to harness my past experiences as a power within my work.